All right? Today our text is in John chapter 1, verse 12. It's a passage of Scripture that you have tucked away in your memory bank. Jesus said this, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the insight and wisdom that you have given us. Now, Father, you be our preacher and our teacher. We'll give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I have discovered in my life, and most especially since I have had the privilege to be in the ministry, and since I've had the privilege to be pastor of this great and awesome church. But one doesn't have to be a Christian for many years until you begin to wonder, is there really such thing as a victorious Christian living? Do I only have the promise of God's forgiveness and eternal salvation, or can I actually experience victory over old habits and over old ways and over the pull of my flesh? And I think if we are absolute honest with ourselves, we would discover that there are multitudes of believers who really know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, who you and I know from their own conversations, maybe we are in that group, who are struggling to live the victorious Christian life. I'm not talking about living the sinless life, None of us are going to do that. Only Jesus did that. Now, if you don't th think you have any sin in your life, see me at the church. And I'll give you a little lecture on hypocrisy and stupidity. They all kind of go together. So all we have to do in our life, all we have to do in, in our church settings is to look around and we find that there are Far, far too many Christians living far below the victory described for us in the New Testament. As I look around and I see people without Jesus Christ as their Savior, living in a world that is filled with immense problems and difficulties, and it's easy to conclude that Christ is their only hope. Ladies and gentlemen, I've said this a lot, and you'll hear me say it again and again and again. Our hope for America is only in Jesus. Now, we're in a mess. I mean, I mean listen, I, it doesn't matter with me if you are a Republican or a Democrat or nothing. We are in a mess in America. And Jesus is our only hope. I'm telling you, our hope is not coming from Washington. It's going to come from the cross. So then I look around and I see those of us who name the name of Christ. And we come to church like this every Sunday. And we, and we sing and we clap and or some people sing and some people clap that others aren't singing. No, I don't think that's exactly the way that's supposed to go down. But, but I often find in this fellowship of believers defeat and discouragement and despair. And I ask myself, why is it that those of us who have the greatest avenue of victory because we have invited Jesus Christ to come into our life, forgive us of our sins and make us a Christian. Why are we still living in defeat? Why are we still struggling? Why are we still beat down by discouragement and despair? 
when we have all the promises. And the sad truth is defeat has become such a norm in the lives of so many Christians that we've come somewhere along the way to have settled for something far less than God intended for us to have. And in my lifetime, well, maybe not in my whole lifetime, because I was there when God put dirt on the ground. An entire industry of counseling has grown up in recent years. And that industry is not just for people that are outside of the church, but for people inside of the church. And that industry, industry is called counseling. Now, I love counseling. I, 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 I do a lot of it. But here's the problem. God never intended for us to have to go to counseling to get over the defeat in our Christian life. Consequently, the natural tendency is to question whether there really is a place for victorious Christian living in the Christian life. Far worse than seeing, I think in my mind, in seeing the defeat of so many Christians around us is seeing our, our own failures in our own lives. Many Christians find themselves held captive to lust and bitterness and anger and anxiety and a host of other heart attitudes that they thought would no longer have a hold on their life when they asked Jesus to come into their life, forgive them of their sins, and make them a Christian. Most of us don't need to be told from some pulpit like this that we are living defeated lives. We face that reality every day. Having said all of that, I want to remind you, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Webster's Dictionary defines power as the ability to do or to act. Have you ever wondered what God's Word actually says about power? What do you envision in your life, in your relationship to Christ, living your everyday life, living with your family, your marriage, your children, on your job, in your relationships with family and friends? What do you envision when you hear that word power? How much power? does the child of the living God possess? Jesus gave us this answer in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said that all the authority of heaven is at our disposal. Jesus said that. Clifton didn't say that. Jesus said that. Some charismatic television preacher didn't say that. Jesus said that. Jesus said all the authority of heaven is at my, your disposal as children of God. When you read the Word of God, it becomes abundantly clear that it is God's will for the church to have power. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, these miraculous signs 
will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and they will drink anything poisonous, and it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. The Bible makes it very, very clear in, in the pages of this book that it is God's desire for every believer to be equipped with the power to heal deadly diseases, to restore finances, failing marriages, and to move every mountain that needs to be moved in our life. That's God's will for your life. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully. God would never ask you to do something that he didn't provide the way for you to do it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? 2,000 years ago, there lived on this earth a man who was God. He raised the dead, he healed the, blame, the lame, and, and he gave uh, hearing to the deaf. He commanded the winds and the waves. He walked on the water. He commanded demons to come out uh, with a single word. He fed a multitude with a few loaves and fishes. He turned water into wine, and he spoke with such authority that the politically correct crowd were stunned with silence. And he made this amazing prediction in John chapter 14, verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Let me tell you what's sad. Today, God has, has equipped the church to do greater works. And we're doing little or no works. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20 says, The kingdom of God is not in word alone, but in power. People in the New Testament were attracted to the church by its power. The new, the new church, this new, new born church on Pentecost, they were steadily moving. They were growing. They were, they were the talk of the nations. They either had riot or revival. They were healing the sick and casting out demons and speaking in tongues and praising God. They were being burned at the stake and fed to the lions because of their testimony for Jesus. But they were not afraid because they believed in the power of God was the only power. And they believed they had that power within themselves. And I tell you today on the authority of the Word of God, it is the will of God for the church to have power. Supernatural power, Pentecostal power, healing power, delivering power, power to pull down strongholds, power to break the chains of misery and habits that enslave, and power to convert, and power to conquer. You said, preacher, all that sounds great. But how do we, how do we here in this church today, how do, we, how do we discover and release this power, this supernatural power that the New Testament church has today that Jesus has given us? The first thing is we recognize who we are in Christ Jesus. Listen to this statement found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. For he has rescued you from the kingdom of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. 
The Bible says when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you were rescued. The New King James Version says delivered. We have been delivered. We have been rescued from the power of darkness. That word translated power is the literally word in the Greek means authority. As a child of the living God, you have been delivered from the power, the authority of darkness and placed into God's glorious kingdom. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That authority was given to you and to me as part of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. The moment that you were saved, you were entered into a position of authority because you are in him and he is in you. Jesus succeeded in securing all authority by going to the cross and dying a horrible death and suffering the penalty for sin and defeating Satan in the very pit of hell itself. He came to this earth as a man for one reason, to recapture the authority that Satan had stolen through Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. And that's why the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, that Jesus was called the last Adam. After securing our power and our authority, he freely gave it over into the hands of those who would believe on him. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is you and me. Listen to what we've been told in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, and chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, listen, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ." 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things are passed away, and all things have become new. The creation that occurs in your life, in my life, the moment that we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior is the same word in the, in the Greek that's found in the Hebrew in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 tells us that God spoke into existence a new creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and light, and light, and light, and light, and light, and light. And all of a sudden, things begin to develop and things begin to happen. When you and I receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, God said, into my life, let there be light and light and light and light and light. And you said, I didn't know that. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Then he said, we're the light of the world. You see, that is... That is what happened in your life. You became a new creation. You are a species that never existed before when you invited Jesus into your heart. The Scriptures refer to us as being in Christ, in Him, in whom occurs 134 times in the Word of God. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The Bible says we are complete and total in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. You already know this. I'm just going to tell you again. There has never been and there will never be another person just like you. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God sowed in your heart the incorruptible seed of God's Word, and you were placed in Christ Jesus and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth. Wait even in him. Verse 13 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Listen to me very carefully today. You can rest assured that whatever the Word of God says about being in Christ belongs to every child of God because you are in Christ Jesus. It means a few things that we can't talk about because we don't have time, but we can talk about some of them. Being in Christ means that you are saved. I like that word, saved. Let's say it together. Saved. Say it again. Saved. I have been saved. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. At that moment, at that moment, when you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and make you a Christian, you crossed over the faith line from death into life, from failure and defeat into victory, from fear and worry into peace that passes understanding, from depression and, and, and heartbreak into joy unspeakable and full of glory. Your past has been forgiven. Your eternal destiny has been sealed, all because of being in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. That may not mean much to you, but it should. That means my past is past. All of those things, all of those ugly things, all of those things that you and I were guilty of are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Never, never, ever, ever, ever to be brought up, thrown into my face again by holy God. Yeah. Ever so often you hear some bonehead preacher say, well, bless God, you're going to have to give an account for that. Well, he needs to study the Word of God. Because the Word of God says in the book of Romans that all of my sins have been charged to Calvary. The book of Romans said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. All of my sins, all of your sins as a believer, past, present, and future have been charged to the cross. Glory to God. In addition to that, being in Christ means that you have authority to stand against Satan. Now, guys, I want you to nail this down today. For the next year, I mean for the next year, we're going to talk about living the Christian life. I have three series of sermons that's going to last, all three of those series of sermons are going to last almost six months. And it has to do with living the Christian life. And I'm telling you, my greatest concern is the greatest failure of the church of the living God is from Monday through Saturday. 
we do all right on Sunday. We pretty well got Sunday figured out. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. One of the most vital areas of the Christian life is our power to successfully stand against Satan. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 says, Neither give place to the devil. In Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul described the armor that we as believers should wear as our stand against Satan. He explains each piece of that armor. It is the armor of God. Now listen carefully. Not one time, not one time does he ever say that God will put the armor on you or that God will fight the devil for you. Not one time. Not one time. Just what, 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 yeah, that's not, that's not what that Bible, oh, yes, it does. You see, when you study Ephesians chapter 6, you'll find out that the you, the you in that scripture is the subject, is the subject. He says, you be strong in the Lord. You put on the whole armor of God that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You take the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, you stand. Listen, child of God, God has given you the power and the authority to stand against Satan and his destructive works. God has provided the armor, but it is your responsibility, it is my responsibility to put on that armor and to stand against the devil. You see, the armor and the power are weapons at our disposal. God is there with you to back you up with His Word, with His name, and with His blood. But all of that is useless until you accept your position of authority and assume the responsibility to use what God has given to you already. You have the, the power, you have the authority to take the Word of God and the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and run Satan out of your affairs. He doesn't have any business in your life. He doesn't have any business in your family. He doesn't have any business in your finances. He doesn't have any business in your workplace. He doesn't have any business in this church. The, because the Bible said, but the Bible said you, you, you have been bought with a price. I have been bought with a price. I am the property of holy, sovereign God. Now, you listen to me carefully. I want you to get this. When Satan tries to come into my life, into my affairs, into my family, into my finances, in my workplace, he's trespassing on God's property because it doesn't belong to him. I belong to him. My family belongs to him. This church belongs to him. He doesn't have any right to be in here. And the only reason he's in here is because we've been stupid enough to let him in. He said, put your own thing. I'm going to like this. Oh, yeah, you're going to love it. I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm not going to say this many more times, probably about a thousand. But there was a day in my life not long ago that I was, according to the, the physicians that live here, that I was just about dead. And I'm telling you, on the authority of the Word of God and the truth of the, of the Word of God, God raised me up. 
He didn't just heal me. He gave me a restoration of power and vision and authority. And he told me, this is what I want you to do. So he set my tail feathers on fire. <laughs> and he said, I want you to preach the rest of your days to tell my people how to live the Christian life every day. And for five months or so or six months or so leading up to 2017, God burned in my heart all of these messages that have to do with the church. You say, but don't you think we ought to be reaching people Jesus? Yeah, get out there and do it. You say, well, that didn't sound nice. I didn't intend to be nice. I'm trying to tell you what God's put on my heart. God's, listen, 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 ladies and gentlemen. If we'll do what God's called us to do, we'll have to baptize so much we'll have dishpan body. <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? Amen. Stand your ground and Satan will flee. Let me close with this. Being in Christ means that you have been given an inheritance. Glory to God. The Bible said in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. The Bible does not say you are going to obtain an inheritance. The Bible says you already have the inheritance. That's yours. Heaven is yours. Power is yours. Salvation is yours. Victory is yours. Peace is yours. Joy is yours. All of these things are the inheritance that you got when you were saved. Live like it. Live like it. Live like it. <laughs> Hebrews said, having become so, so much better than the angels, and he has by inheritance obtain more excellent name than they. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and 10 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the church. We are the church. Us. We. Us. We're the church. You want to know where the church of God has gotten today? Go home. And take a long look in the mirror. And the person looking back at you represents the church of the living God. If you've never invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins and make you a Christian, I encourage you to do so today. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, I want you to lift your hands up. If you're visiting, you can lift your hands up. If you're a Baptist, you can hold your hands up and not be in a business meeting. I know most of you didn't know that. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Say it out loud with me, Father. Thank you for your word. Regardless of what the world might say and regardless of what my friends might say, I ask you to allow me to see myself 
as I really am in Christ Jesus. From this day forward, give me the courage and the faith to stand in the authority as a child of the living God for your glory. I confess that I can because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. In Jesus' name, amen.